our yoga board on Diana. We are talking about the seventh limb of yoga, so we are nearing the end. And this is kind of a tricky part of the whole scope of the eight limbs of yoga because as we get toward six, seven, and eight, things become more abstract. It's a little bit more difficult to define exactly what we're talking about, especially with Diana. So Diana is usually translated as meditation. And this is kind of a tricky thing because the word meditation is very frequently misused. And we kind of touched on this a little bit in the talk about Dharana when we were talking about concentration, saying that a lot of times things that are actually techniques to help the mind concentrate, to create a one-pointed focus, and to still the distracting thoughts of the mind is frequently called meditation, even though it should actually be called concentration. So then, when we get to dhyana, and we start to talk about the real yogic term of meditation, it gets a little bit more difficult to actually define exactly what this experience of meditation is. And I think it's important to start out by saying, there's really nothing in this video that I can say that's going to help you to fully 100% grasp what meditation is, because that is only something that you can understand through experience. Um, hopefully the information that we're going to talk about here is going to show you how to make it easier to get to that point so that you can actually experience what that feeling is like, what that state is like. So when we go into meditation, usually we're starting out in the previous limb. We're starting out in concentration. We come into usually a seated posture that you feel like you can sustain for a period of time without too much discomfort, whether that's sitting on the floor or sitting in a chair, something where your back is upright so that you have this state of alertness. It's a little bit different than what we do when we go down into Shavasana, although in Shavasana you might attain a meditative state because you're so relaxed and you're on the floor, there's that tricky point where a lot of people will kind of drift toward a sleep-like state, where in a seated meditation, we want to have a higher level of alertness so that we don't drift into that tiredness. But um, in meditation, it is this process of setting the body up so that we can maintain that alertness, whatever position that might be. Don't get too stuck on the position that you have to sit in lotus or anything like that. Seated, you can have something behind your back if you need it, a wall, a chair, anything like that. So then we start by doing what I call plowing the field. So if you are a farmer and you want to plant a seed to get a certain kind of crop, then you have to prepare the field so that that crop is going to be able to take root and grow and you'll end up with the finished product that you're looking for. The same thing is true in meditation. If we want to get to this very strong inwardly focused stillness, then we have to prepare all the other layers of our being so that we can get to that point. So the physical body, the um, package that we're in that we use to do asana practice is the outermost layer. And first, we usually do some asanas, and that's a few different reasons. We want to prepare the physical body so that we can sit and be still. It's very helpful because most of us are not good at just being still. We have to burn off some of that energy, and we have to move our joints around so that we don't feel stiff and restricted. It also has the other bonus of opening up the spaces that we use to breathe, which brings us down to that next layer, which is the energetic body, the pranamaya kosha. So through our breath, we're able to regulate our energy. We don't want to be too upregulated where we're anxious or we're fidgety, and we don't want to be so downregulated that we fall asleep. So we use the process of doing asanas, doing breath work, to get to this really steady middle ground with our energy and our physical body, very balanced. So in that space, 
we're able to go in one more layer to the mind, to the monomyocotia. And this is where things really start to get hectic. Our minds are so busy, and we've talked about concepts like the monkey mind or the mind and specifically emotions as being like a wild elephant that can be very, very destructive. So we get to this point and I have this squiggly green line around where the mind is because in yoga we talk about the fluctuations in the mind or the vrittis, these waves that come up. And you can think of them as any of the thousands and thousands of thoughts that you have throughout the day. Those thoughts pull you out away from these deeper layers. They're usually thoughts that are related to the external environment, things that you have to do, places that you have to go, anything on your to-do list or your shopping list or whatever it might be. And then you have other thoughts that maybe are um, self-deprecating thoughts or thoughts of fear, thoughts of anxiety, of worry. Those are going to create some really big ripples. And those are the things that are going to cloud our ability to see down into those lower layers. So that gets in the way. You can think of a pond, and this is always really helpful to me when I try to meditate. I think of the surface of a pond. And based on whatever I feel like my mind is like at that moment, if I had a really busy day and my thoughts are kind of all over the place, the surface of that pond starts out being very choppy. And at that point, because of that choppiness, I can't see down to the bottom of the pond. That choppiness is obscuring my view. So as I use tools to anchor, to concentrate, like focusing on my breath, like using a mantra or visualizing, focusing on my heart center, all of those different tools, depending on the day, whatever one I feel like is going to work the best for me that day, little by little, my thoughts start to slow down and they have more space in between them. So the surface of that pond starts to become still until I get to the point where my thoughts have a good amount of space in between them. So I can rest in that pause, in that perfect mirror-like stillness at the surface of the pond. Every once in a while, a thought is still going to come up a lot of times it'll be some kind of a distraction. You might hear a sound, somebody might say something, or it might be an internal distraction where I will think my foot's uncomfortable or my back is getting tired, something like that. So that thought comes up and it forms this opening ripple on the surface. And I just try to let it open and dissolve so that it comes back to that place of stillness. And you'll do that process over and over until you get to a place where you feel like you can let go of that anchor. So letting go of that complete focus and control on the breath or a lot of times what I'll do is a mantra practice because I find that to be very anchoring. So eventually I'll get to the point where I feel like the mind is focused enough that I can start to dissolve my mantra and I let go of repeating it over and over and see how long I can stay in that space of stillness. So now once the surface of that pond is really still, then you're able to look down at the deeper layers underneath. So this is where that squiggly green line is a little bit more of a smooth green line, and we can see underneath to the wisdom layer. And this is such an important thing because it's one of those places that we think of as our inner resource where we can get information and we can get answers that come from this deep place of wisdom. When the mind is too busy, it blocks us off from that place. We're not able to access that. So calming the mind is very important to being able to access that inner wisdom. Underneath that, even more important, is that layer of bliss, that unconditional happiness and joy of being alive that is always present within us. But again, when the mind is really busy, it blocks us from seeing that. We're distracted, it's obscured. Sometimes we'll talk about it like a veil, that there's a veil over our eyes that keeps us from seeing these deeper layers, they're obscured. 
underneath that layer of bliss is the core. And this is the part where meditation becomes something very different than what we talk about in popular culture. This is where we're going all the way down to the core of who you are. And we can put any number of different labels on that. We can call it the soul. We often call it the true self or the Atman in yoga. Whatever word works for you, just know that to be the very deepest core of your being. And it's that constant still point that is ever present within you. Through the practice of all of the limbs of yoga, we're trying to make the awareness of that still point something that is easier for us to access at any point during our day. It's always there. We just lose awareness of it. Just like all the other layers, the bliss layer, the wisdom layer, it's always there. But most of the time, the mind is so active and it demands so much of our energy and our attention that we don't notice the other ones underneath there. They're obscured. So the process of practicing dharana and concentrating the mind, focusing it on one point, and then being able to dissolve that single pointed concentration to settling into a place of awareness of the true self, of just, it's like sitting in your own core and staying there without being pulled out to the periphery. And if you've ever tried to sit and concentrate or sit and meditate, you know that you will get these glimpses of what that state is. And like I said, it's not something that I can fully describe in words. You really have to do the work to get to that point. And then afterwards, you'll be able to look back and say, I think I got into that state of meditation. I was there. It was still, it was peaceful. It was just a complete sense of being without having to do anything. So once you get that experience, then you know what it feels like. You can go back and try to use the tools to get yourself back to that point, right? Think about the farmer. You have to plow that field. You have to do your asana practice. You have to do your breath work. You have to do your concentrating, anchoring task. And then after all of that, when the mind is still, then we get that glimpse at the deeper layers. So for me, Meditation is really being able to go into this space where the mind is quiet enough that I'm able to look down at the deeper layers of being and to spend some amount of time just sitting in that stillness and sitting in that awareness. You're going to get a lot of different interpretations of this and a lot of different definitions of this, but I'm going to give you a few quotes from some articles that I read by Swami Rama, and he was the founder of the Himalayan Institute. He, the way that he describes meditation just resonates really well with me. So my favorite one says, meditation is not what you think. Literally, it is not what you think. For it is beyond thinking. Okay? So this is where I think the clear distinction comes in between dharana and dhyana the sixth and seventh limb of yoga concentration. We're still functioning at a level of thought. When we move into meditation, that level of thought has dissolved into this awareness of being without putting the words into it or having the mind become a part of that. So think about that when you're trying to get a handle on this whole concept of meditation. And then um, I'll give you one more quote. So it says, It is true that the whole of the body is within the mind, but the whole of the mind is not in the body. So I think that this quote underlines the fact that asana practice of doing postures is going to get us so far into our practice. And then there is a wall that happens where if you are only doing asana practice, if you're only doing postures and you're not exploring the other limbs of yoga of concentration and breath work and moving into meditation, that you're only going to be able to progress so far because you're not getting that concept of the mind and our awareness being that really deep down layer.
asana practice isn't quite going to be able to get us there because when you're doing your asana, it's more of a concentration technique. So you're concentrating on the way that that posture affects your breath. You're concentrating on what sensation that posture is creating for you, what thoughts are rising up internally for you during that posture, all sorts of things, how it changes your energy. There's a lot of information coming in that your brain is processing during that practice. And you'll have points in between there, very small glimpses where you might have clarity, but it doesn't last very long because there's so many things that you're trying to hold together. If you float off into space for too long, then your breath isn't going to be right, or you might lose alignment in the posture. So just keeping that in mind, that your asana practice is a really awesome tool for taking care of your physical body and helping you to move into a space where meditation is going to be more possible, but it can't be practiced in isolation. You have to have all the other practices of the eight limbs of yoga put together. So here's our other quote. It says, remember, it is not the thoughts that disturb you, but your reaction to them. And we always in meditation have this experience of getting to that still point and then a thought rises up. Coming back into that still point and a thought rises up. And a lot of times it'll go something like this. You're meditating, you get to that place of stillness, something pops into your head. I'm hungry. I want to go eat something. And then you have this other reaction to that thought of, why am I thinking about that? I'm trying to meditate right now. This is ridiculous. Why isn't this working? Or something along those lines. So then you try to come back into that stillness. But your reaction to that thought of being hungry or whatever it might have been has actually made bigger ripples than the thought itself. So this is our exercise that actually translates really nicely into the rest of our life. Something happens, and a lot of times our reaction to what happened is worse than that event itself, and our reaction creates a bigger ripple or a bigger wave than whatever it is that we were actually dealing with. So meditation becomes a playground for us to work on the skills of watching something come up pausing, noticing. So think of meditation as this process of sitting in the seat of the soul, going down the layers, going down the layers until you find that place of stillness. The longer that you practice and the better your preparation to move into meditation, the longer you're going to be able to stay in that space and the more quickly you'll be able to get there. But I will say that certain days you will be on and you will get into that state of meditation and it will be amazing and blissful and you'll come out of it and you'll think that was an amazing meditation practice. And there will be other days where your mind is in a hundred different directions and no matter how much you try to anchor, your mind is still busy. And that's where we come back to that space of observation, watching the thoughts come up, trying not to react to it, not letting yourself move into that space of aggravation because your meditation practice wasn't what you expected it to be or wanted it to be that day. It also becomes a practice of understanding how your experiences from the rest of your day have had an impact on your internal state. Because I know that if I have a really busy, hectic day where there were a lot of stressful events, when I get to sit down and still myself, it's going to take me a lot longer to get to that point of meditation if it happens at all that day. Whereas if I have a day where I'm practicing mindfulness more frequently, I am being aware of my breath, I'm trying to give myself little moments where I can pause and recenter, by the time I get to my meditation practice, I'm not that far off, so it's going to be a shorter distance for me to move into a true state of meditation. So what we expose ourselves to during the day is going to have a big impact on how quickly we're able to get into that state or how deeply we're able to get into that state of being connected to the soul or the true self. So it is a stillness 
and an awareness of the deepest layers of our being. Um, I love The Power of Now by Eckhart Tolle um, because it talks about so many different aspects of being in the present moment. Not only when you're sitting and trying to do a formal meditation, but using that as a concentration technique throughout your whole day, no matter what you're doing. That really helpful process of training the mind to be present makes meditation much, much easier. Um, so I think that hopefully will give you a pretty good idea of what you're going to experience when you are able to get to a place of meditation, when you get that first little glimpse and then you know what you're trying to come back to. But be aware of this process in our culture of using meditation in the wrong context. As long as you understand what is concentration, what is meditation, and um, try not to get that mixed up. And I'll just end off by saying that meditation is beyond that concept of thinking because meditation is the step before samadhi. So we have our last board, which will be next week, and samadhi means enlightenment. It is the end goal, if you will, of practicing yoga. And that is a whole different version of consciousness. It's a version of consciousness where you have complete connection to everything and you're constantly connected to your core, to your true self. You never lose that connection once you get to the point of sustaining samadhi. So meditation is also an altered state of consciousness that goes beyond thinking. Think of it as being one step off from that state of enlightenment. Okay, so thank you so much for joining me and I hope you are going to come back for our eighth board to complete the series next week. Thank you so much. Namaste.